Well, here is video number two in our genetics lesson for this week. So I'm pretty excited. Again, like I said, this is my favorite unit. We talked about Mendelian ratios, a three to one ratio. And we talked about what is a trait, a physical appearance, what something looks like, okay, or a particular characteristic that you have. Uh, maybe it's um, having a uh, particular syndrome or not. And so we have two different forms of the trait, the dominant and the recessive. When you have two of the same allele or form of the trait paired up together, we call that homozygous. So if you have two big T's, that's homozygous dominant. If you have two little t's, two recessive alleles, we call that homozygous recessive. So our tall pea plants in our Mendelian genetics example, two copies of the dominant allele together made a homozygous dominant. Now we call these letters the genotype, right? The letters that determine what the trait would look like. The genotype is the letters determined by what DNA a person has, what their genes are telling them that they're going to express. You will see the word a purebred. Now a purebred, a lot of you think about dogs or cats or horses. When we use the term strictly genetic speaking, they mean homozygous. They mean these plants are true breeding. If I only bred together big T, big T and big T, big T, I would always get a purebred big T, big T tall plant. So then what is the opposite? What if I have a big T, a dominant allele, and a recessive little t? Well, we would call that heterozygous. Because the big T outranks, overpowers, is dominant to the little t, what kind of a pea plant is this? This is going to be a tall pea plant. Is it homozygous? No, it has it carries a recessive allele with it. It does not show the recessive trait, but it can pass that to its offspring. So it is a hybrid. It's a cross between the homozygous recessive parents and it has the recessive allele. Does it show the recessive? No. As long as you have the dominant allele, you get the dominant trait, the dominant phenotype. So when we talk about a trait, a physical appearance, that is a phenotype. What does that organism look like? Is it a um, guinea pig that is black or white hair or fur color? Is my eye color brown or blue? These are what you can look at, your physical characteristics, what something looks like. It can be things as well, things like having a disorder like Huntington disease or no Huntington disease. Again, a genotype is the letters. Is it two of the same letters? Is it homozygous? Is it two different letters? Is it heterozygous? And then again, we have to look at the ratios of the offspring. How many have the tall phenotype, the tall trait? How many of the offspring had the short trait? And that's what we call a phenotypic ratio. It compares the appearances of the offspring as opposed to the genotype ratio, which shows what are the alleles that each of the individuals have. So going back to our original example, our Mendel example, we took a tall pea plant, homozygous, right? It was big T, big T, it had two of the same alleles. We made it with a short pea plant, two little T's. And what were all of the offspring? Well, all of the offspring were tall. Why were they tall? Because they had that dominant allele that overpowered the recessive. So were they homozygous? No, they had a dominant allele, big T, and a recessive, so they are heterozygous. So now we take these F1 offsprings, the heterozygous, and we meet them together. Now, how are we seeing this short comeback? Why? Because each parent had a recessive allele that they carried. Didn't make them short, though. Their big T dominant allele was masking or overpowering that short, but when they have offspring, one in every four was a short offspring. So this is what we call a monohybrid cross. We're only looking at one trait, the height of the pea plant. That's the trait. It's either short or tall. Those are the phenotypes, the appearances, the physical, what they look like. 
Why are they short or tall? Because of the alleles they have. Are they dominant big T alleles or are they recessive little T alleles? Why do you get an allele? Because you inherited DNA, you inherited chromosomes from your offspring, sorry, from your parents. Okay, so this is complete dominance, right? It's either tall or it's short. There's no mediums, right? There's no in-between size. We either have the big T completely dominant over the little T, it completely wins out or masks the little T, or we get two little T's and the two little T's together are homozygous for the recessive, that would be a short pea plant. So now genetics is, it's simple probability, it's simple mathematics. We look to see how many possible offspring can we have based on the total number of offspring. That's what we look at when we're deciding what is my ratio or how many offspring have it and don't have a particular disorder. So when we're doing examples of probability, here's one where we have cystic fibrosis. This is a recessive disorder. So we know that the recessive allele, you have to have two recessive alleles for the person to inherit this disease. And it is autosomal. Now you'll remember that we talked about autosomal being from one of the body chromosomes. And we said that human beings have... Um, sorry, body chromosomes. Human beings have 46 chromosomes, right? 23 from mom, 23 from dad. And chromosomes number one through 22 are the body chromosomes. The 23rd pair, that is your sex chromosome. So we're not looking at that 23rd pair, the XX or the XY. We're not looking at those here. We're looking at these body chromosomes. So they're saying that we are looking for the probability of two carriers, two heterozygous individuals having a son that's affected with this cystic fibrosis. So the first thing you do is you set yourself up a legend and you write out what's my dominant to I'm going to use capital C. No CF, they are normal, unaffected individual. Little c, and I'm handwriting this out so I can tell the difference between big C's and little C's. This, uh, if you have two copies, then you would be affected by it. This is our recessive allele, right? And we're just showing the allele. And then what we have to do is to decide what are the parents going to be? Well, it just said they're both carriers. They're heterozygous. So what does that mean? Well, it means that each parent has a big C and a little C. They have a dominant allele, the big C, and they have the little C. Then what do we do? Then we look at what gametes are made by the parents. Big C, little C for this parent, big C, little C for this parent. Now what? Well, next step is to set up your Punnett square. So you set up your Punnett square and Here's the female parent, here's the male parent. Now, what do I do? So I'm going to drop down, here's the big C from mom. Here is the big C from dad. Does that offspring, does that child have cystic fibrosis? No, they don't, they have a big C and so this individual has no cystic fibrosis, they are unaffected. Okay, so now let's look, here's a big C from dad and a little C from mom. Does this person, this offspring have cystic fibrosis? No, they don't. They are normal. They have no cystic fibrosis. Why? Because they have the normal unaffected allele. Okay, so then we're going to do this for the next two offspring, another normal unaffected and uh-oh, little C, little C, recessive from mom, recessive from dad, this individual has cystic fibrosis. It is a one in four chance of having an offspring that has this disorder to be affected by cystic fibrosis. So going back to the question, now we've written out, and I like to leave lots of space in my Punnett square so that I can write not only the genotype, the letters, big C, big C, or big C, little c, but I also like to write the phenotype in there and then I feel that it's very important that when you're doing a question, you circle the individuals that you're talking about. We're talking about the one that's affected with CF. So which one is affected? This particular offspring. One in four chance of being affected with cystic fibrosis. Is that your final answer? No, it's not. You have one more thing to consider. What's the probability of having a son? 
Well, now that's a completely separate thing, right? It is independent of whether you have cystic fibrosis or not. So what do you do? Well, you've got one in four chance of being affected by cystic fibrosis. You also have to look at the probability of having a son. Well, you either have a daughter or a son. So the probability of having a son is one half. Well, now what do I do? I've got two separate numbers here. Well, this is what you have to do. This is called the probability rule. You're going to have to go now, sorry, the product rule. You have to multiply these together. That's what it means, the product. You take the one half chance that you have a son times the one quarter chance that you have an individual, an offspring affected. What do you get? You get one in eight probability or possibility. And if you do that on your calculator, you one divided by eight is 0.125. 0.125 is the decimal, the chance, the probability, the possibility that you get a son that is affected with cystic fibrosis. Okay, so we're going to do a couple of example problems next and some monohybrid crosses. And then we will talk about how do we do um, test cross and what is a sex link disorder. Okay, so this is video number two for genetics. I'm going to sign off and be ready for another video. Talk later.